So now we all have to remember what happened on Tuesday. Oh boy, a lot. So there were a couple of things we talked about that said this is what a good primary key is. This is what, when we know we've got good primary keys, this is what we've got. Does anyone remember? It's a kind of integrity. Does anyone remember what kind of integrity I'm talking about when I have good primary keys? Referential integrity. Nope, that's foreign keys. We're ahead of the game. As always. What is what is the thing that has to do with primary key integrity? Uniqueness. Uniqueness, that's one of the attributes, yeah. That's one of the aspects of it. What's another one? Well, what's first of all, what's it called? Is it just a database of integrity? <laughs> the word for it. So good primary key. Table that has good primary keys, and as you say, uh, each each primary key is unique. And there's the other aspect of it, which is every record has a primary key. Those are the two aspects of this thing. What's it called? Yes, entity integrity. Entity. That's the first thing. You've got a table, it's got to have entity integrity. It's got to have good primary keys. If it doesn't, stop, go back to go, and not collect $200. Okay, so that's a table where every record has its own primary key. Now I've got two tables. And this is where referential integrity starts to be important. Now the last column I'm going to have over here is a foreign key of some sort, primary key. Now, good foreign keys have, what is it? Richard, referential integrity? Yes. Well, these are integers. Primary keys are integers. So these have to be integers, that's right. But more than that, it has to do with can there be nulls here? No. Oh. Yeah. So if I have a record and it's associated with this other thing, I've got table A, table B, and my ERD says that every A has. Every A has to point to a B somewhere. Every one of these foreign keys has to exist because every A belongs to a B. Every line item in an invoice belongs to an invoice. So if I have line items and I have invoices, it doesn't make any sense to have a line item that doesn't have an invoice. An orphan line item is, is a lonely and wrong thing. So, wrong. so let's say I've got two invoices. Invoice. Invoice. That means that every one of these things has to be either in this invoice or in this other invoice. If that's true, if every one of these has a foreign key and it points to a real record. 
Then I've got referential integrity. So the first thing is primary key integrity, where the table itself has good stuff going on. The second thing is referential integrity, where every foreign key points to a record. It's a real record. At that point, we've got good keys. We've got a table that's integral of its own. It's got good primary keys. I've got, if I have references, they're all good. I've got no dangling pointers. I've got no bad things. Okay, so that's the first two qualities we're looking for in that table. All right. Then we spend some time on Tuesday looking at attributes. Now, as you know, attributes are characteristics of an entity. You know, things like height, weight, you know, the room you're in if you happen to be a section. They are the columns in a database. These are attributes. There are four, well, there's two different ways of classifying attributes. Do you remember? Remember? Decompose. Whether they can be decomposed or not. So, there's, I have to look this up too. Okay, da, 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 da. So there is simple. What's the other word for simple? Atomic. 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 Remember, atomic is not so much that it glows in the dark. Atomic is like it's the Greeks. Remember, they thought that you couldn't make anything smaller than an atom. That atoms could not be broken. Boy, were they wrong. But it took us a couple thousand years to figure that out. The other side of an attribute, the other aspect of this, is it's, somebody already said it, atomic or composite. So basically, it has parts. And in here, it has one part. So the example we used was a composite attribute was like address. One, two, three, any street, any town, USA. You can break that up into pieces. Now, why do I want to break? I'm going to tell you that this one is better than this one. <coughs> simple is better than composite. Why do I say that? Why? Anyone? Do you like? It's more difficult to search to many parts compared to one part? Yes. This one is more difficult to search. That's the one thing. More difficult to update. This complicates your life. So, when we're looking, when we're trying to get to a good data table, we're going to try and find any of our composite attributes and break them up into simple attributes. Now there's two other kinds of qualities of attributes that we explored, and that is single value or multi Someone give me an example of a single valued attribute. Well, just tell me what a single valued attribute is. First name? Right, you only have one first name. So, by definition, it's the first. Even if you have 20 names, like poor Prince Charles, only one of them comes first. So, any one of us can only have one first name. What's a multi valued attribute? you're lucky enough to have two homes through your lifetime or all at once, you can have more than one address. And I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to 
to try and convince you that this one is better than this one. That multi-value should be changed somehow into single value. Again, why? Why is it better to be single value than As in culture, the search, easier to find information. Easier to find. Easier for a computer to find. In all of these cases, in fact, you can draw it like a matrix where I've got simple and composite, and I've got single and multi. try and get to this corner all the time. Why? Because it helps me break down the problem into its simplest pieces. It helps me see the problem in its simplest pieces. The tide is coming in here, folks. We are trying to take that database, that table design, and make it as simple and as obvious as we can. we did on Tuesday is we saw a little example of how we do these things. And there is, in general, at least in this class, there's really pretty much one technique that we use to do this. To change one kind of attribute into another kind of attribute. And what is that technique? Decomposition. Decomposition. And how do we do that? You've got to decide which moment to the address city. Split the you split multi-value attributes up. No, you split composite attributes up into atomic things. So you take a big column and you split it up and you make additional column, uh, columns. So now you have multiple attributes where you have just have one thing. And then how do we deal with multi-value attributes? If I have several addresses that I have to store for a particular person, instead of saying address one and then another column and address two, and then another column and address three, and who knows how far I'm going to take this. Instead of doing that, what do I do? Make another table. I make another table. So if I had an address that used to be an address, and now I have to take it so that it can handle more than one address, instead of adding columns, I make a new table. And it's just all addresses. Address 1, address 2, address 3. I give it a primary key. And then I make this a foreign key. I won't deal with naming here right now. But now this one person, the primary key is 1, if they've had three addresses over the course of their lives, that's great. person has one or many addresses. An address belongs to the person. I use the belongs to, and I think, oh, wow, okay, the foreign key goes over here. That's our little trick. When you say an address belongs to a person, then I know I have to do a foreign key in the address table. The other thing, the other reason you can see that this is where the foreign key goes is because I've only got one person and I've got multiple addresses. So all of these foreign keys have to point to the same. That's really the tricky part of this whole thing, is when I'm going to break one of these multi-valued attributes up, figuring out where to put the foreign key and where to put the primary key is always the tricky part. Knowing that it goes this way or it goes the other way is, is the, the first one.
believe in only God. You can always help yourself by writing out the business rule and by drawing the ERD. When you look at the, the cardinality, there's one of the many. When you look at the relationships, if it belongs to a certain thing, you should have the form. Okay, so now we've got our tool for We can break things up, we can um, change composite values into single values, we can break things up, we can take multi-values, we can um, extract them and put them in a table. Now we're going to organize that kind of activity, we're going to call it normalization. We're going to take the first step, make sure we've got good keys, we're going to take the second step, make sure we've got good attributes, and we'll keep going. There's actually six or more layers of normalization. There's a lot of stuff you can do to a database to make it better and better and better. We're only going to worry about the first three. So we're going to dive back into this wonderful PowerPoint. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That breaks every rule I told you to follow. Did your dad ever tell you to do as I say, not as I do? Yes. Did that bug you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's the thing, is we, we, we complain about our parents and then we make exactly the same mistake. And in fact, as an instructor, I'm making exactly the same mistake. You know, the one day, the one day I remember my dad <coughs> slipping out of character, uh, I got in trouble a lot when I was a kid. I got in trouble an awful lot. More than I am proud of. I used to, I, I went to a very strict school and when they caught you, you had to write out punishments. You know, like Bart Simpson on the blackboard. Except I had to write them out hand -held. Thank you. Um, And I remember the day that I came home with yet, no, it's the same, same way. Thank you, though. This no, looks... No, it's like lower down. It's nice to the laptop. That's okay. Thank you. Um, I remember the uh, day my dad said, uh, in an unguarded moment, Al, it doesn't matter what you do, just don't get caught. And the second thing that came out of my mom's lips was, what? <laughs> And it was because of her reaction that I remember what he said to this day. Because, <laughs> you know, he didn't say anything that the rest of us aren't weren't already saying to each other. But it was the way my mom said, what? That I thought, oh, that's important. Okay, so we were going through these examples. I think this is where we stopped last week. Let me turn off the lights so you can see it a little better. <laughs> so this is a situation where we had a bunch of attributes. The other thing we were seeing is there are a lot of nulls in this table. That out of a huge set of employees, only three people had airplane licenses, and so we needed to factor that out. So we took these attributes, we put them in their own table greatly simplified the employee table. And it made this thing very small. It only has three records in it, rather than however many nulls I would have to store. Because if you remember, nulls take up space. They take up storage. And then you have to manage them. So you should make your table so they're as dense as possible. So they are as information rich. Next topic I'd like to talk about is, we've been talking about one-to-many relationships. We just talked about how one person has many addresses. Let's talk a little bit about many-to-many -many relationships. This is a way that you can relate to entities. So, with people and addresses, especially if, say, it's an apartment, not only can you live in many apartments throughout your life, but an apartment can have many inhabitants. Of its life. It's. So the question is, how do we store many to many relationships? With a one to many relationship, you have a, a, a 
from a foreign key that points to the other table. It's not a good idea to have a foreign key that points to one table and a foreign key that points to the other table. The better way of handling that is to hide. Make sure you hit the sign-up sheet. The better way to handle that is to um, is to have an intermediate table. We hit this last week, if you remember. So for a person and an apartment, for example, I've got this table where there's lots of people, and I've got this table where there's lots of apartments. What I basically do is I make a list of, well, at one point, person, apartment, at one point, person one was in apartment one. And then later on, person one went to apartment two. At some point, person two was in apartment two, and then they moved to apartment three. So it's just this long list of at one point, one person lived in this apartment, and somebody else lived in this apartment, and somebody else lived in this apartment. These things are nothing more than foreign keys. I've got an apartment. Since it's a table, it's got its own little primary key column, but the primary key column is typically just managed by the database engine, so I don't typically show it. So this is the way you implement many to many. We're reviewing now. If I've got many people in many apartments, I have an intermediate table that just points in both directions. This intermediate table often contains more data than just those two forms. Sometimes the intermediate table contains, well, I don't know, uh, when the lease started, when the lease ended, um, how much they paid, that kind of stuff. It stores information about the relationship between those two entities. It's a convenient place to put it. Sometimes you'll see that depicted on a diagram as, here's the two entities, here's information that relates to the relationship. We don't use this notation in our class, but that's how they do it. So that's how we handle many-to-many -many relationships. In this um, presentation, you'll see avoid many-to-many -many relationships. What they really mean there is avoid putting foreign keys that crisscross into tables. Always factor that out into an intermediate table. The last thing that we're going to talk about but not actually do anything with in this class is recursive. Relationships. Can anyone tell me what recursive means? Recursive. A really wonky computer tech kind of thing. Okay, so let me see if I have a simple uh, way of defining it. I don't. Recursive directory structure is kind of following down the, the tree, sort of, but. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have a way of doing it. So, uh, do, 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 pictures? Yeah. Pardon me? Pictures? Um, yeah, yeah. Let's see what we can do here. No, I was copying the bottom part. Say that again, please? Copying the bottom part. I was copying the top part. Oh, okay. Just go back for like five seconds, please. I'm sorry, did you hear you? Do you want to go back for five seconds so I can copy the bottom part? Copying your PowerPoint. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Sorry. Back to here. Here? Yeah. Uh, okay. Alright. Those are available on the uh, this is in the uh, this is in D2L. Um, this is the first of the two presentations that are on D2L. Okay, what we're about to get is the second one. Um, Let's just make it simple. This is a situation where an entity is related to itself, usually in some other situation. For example, um, in this situation, um, if 
we wanted to match, we wanted to have a, a database that tracked when different teams played each other. You would have a table that was games and teams. And this would always be pointing here. If you wanted to say on a particular date who played, then you would say, well, this team played that team. But this sort of relationship where the table points to itself is troublesome. That's why I created this other table for games. So in this situation where I have to deal with the situation where one team is directly related to another, I make up an entity. I name it games. Here's another situation where I have a database that stores classes. So the prerequisite, although it's not enforced, for CS, uh, CIS 121 is CIS 120. So instead of designing my table so that 121 points to 120, I'm going to make another table called prerequisites. I'm going to create an entity. So I can store real simple foreign keys. Prerequisite for CIS 120 is, or CIS 121 is 120. So again, it's a situation where it's a really interesting thing, happens all the time, it's trouble. It's hard for us to represent it using this table and relationships model, so we just make up an entity. Now let's get on to the next one. So that was the first um, presentation. Let's um, take a short break. And then we'll go into the next.